Last episode, I mean last video on chapter 13, part 2, we learned about how structure relates to a function in the chloroplast in the last part. And we learned how the granum and the stroma are structurally adapted to perform photosynthesis. But what I left out from the slides was how structure and function uh, what are the structures and functions in a palisade mesophyll cell and how the structure related function in a leaf? Now, um, these slides were previously missed out, but I re-uploaded the slides, so make sure you download them if you have printed them and uh, print the last few slides again. Just the last few has been changed, the ones in front remain the same. Anyway, let's go right into how structure relates to function in a palisade mesophyll cell first. Now there are two major factors here. Number one is the overall ar cell arrangement and shape and number two is the positioning of the chloroplast in a palisade mesophyll cell. Now when we talk about palisade mesophyll cell, obviously we are talking about the ones in the leaf uh, which are arranged at this upper surface right here. Well upper not surface but upper region right here and we can see that hey they are closely packed to absorb maximum light they have a large surface area for diffusion of gases and they are vertical to the surface of the leaf to reduce the number of cross walls um, this is all to maximize the light absorbed now of course the cell walls of these palisade mesophyll cells are also thin Moist cell surfaces are present and they are also very near the air spaces to, to circulate gases and all these are really to maximize the efficiency of diffusion of gases. So that's cell arrangement and shape. Now coming on to the idea about chloroplasts. Now I don't know if you realize but they have a large amount of chloroplast to absorb maximum light obviously and they have this huge vacuole that pushes the chloroplast to the edge of the cell so that obviously there will be a short diffusion path for carbon dioxide and they also can max, uh, absorb maximum light uh, by being at the edge of the cell. Now something that's interesting would be that chloroplast actually can move and uh, rotate if you may they can move towards the light when needed and they can move away from high light intensity to avoid damage. I'm not saying that chloroplast has its own conscience, but the plant cell knows what to do. Anyways, um, that is uh, how structure relates to function in a palisade mesophyll cell. But when we look at how structure relates to function in a dicotyledonous leaf, and this might be an essay question, it might ask the question slightly differently. Um, and you have to answer accordingly. So when it comes to a dicot leaf, the idea is to talk about the um, overall shape again. So it is thin and flat. Leaves are thin and flat to give a large surface area to volume ratio. And they're also held right angles to the sun. This means facing the sun, essentially, to allow maximum light absorption. Now what we can do also when we talk about the leaf is to talk about the, its internal structure but this time not only focusing on the palisade mesophyll cells but focusing on every single layer. So we can say, hey, it has a cuticle to prevent water loss via corticular transpiration. Uh, it has palisade mesophyll for obvious reasons. There's spongy mesophyll and both those mesophylls have moist surfaces for diffusion of gases and again provides a large surface area for CO2 uptake. They have stomata and guard cell or guard cells. So two guard cells, we got one stomata, by the way, for entry of carbon dioxide. Even has xylem to supply water and mineral ions and for support, don't forget support, and phloem for translocation of these products of photosynthesis. And as you can see, all three um, things that I've talked about, chloroplasts, um, palisade mesophyll cells, and the dicot leaf are all um, structurally adapted in order to carry out and maximize the rate of photosynthesis. Which leads me to the content of this actual video, which is chapter 13, part 3 on limiting factors as well as later on C4 plants. Now, when we talk about limiting factors, what we're talking about is the factors that restrict a process's rate. And obviously, you know this already. So 
I think the limiting factors here are pretty obvious. Number one, it is light intensity. Number two, we'll be talking about um, concentration of carbon dioxide in number three. We'll be talking about temperature. So light intensity and um, carbon dioxide concentration is pretty obvious. You will expect it the rate of photosynthesis to increase with both light intensity and carbon dioxide concentration because these are the initial things that it needs. But you will also expect for the graph to level off, to plateau. Why? Because there are actually other limiting factors present. So if the light intensity graph seen here um, levels off, this is probably due to temperature or the concentration of carbon dioxide present. Whereas if the graph of the carbon dioxide concentration levels off, this probably is due to temperature and light intensity. Now, the third limiting factor here, if you have gotten a hint, is obviously temperature. Now, the rate of photosynthesis does increase with temperature, as you can see, but decreases after the optimum temperature. Now, there are a few reasons for this. Um, number one, it's because Rubisco, which is a special enzyme we learned last video from the Kelvin cycle, right? Usually, it takes RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, and combines it with CO2. But at high temperature, Rubisco is strange because it has a higher tendency to catalyze a reaction between O2, oxygen, and RUBP instead of CO2, which is weird. And this is why the rate of photosynthesis might decrease after the optimum. But also, for obvious reasons that you know in chapter 3 already, at high temperatures, enzymes also start to denature and do not work as optimum temperature anymore. So um, the rate of reaction slows down. Now we'll get back to the photorespiration part later on when we talk about C4 plants and how they overcome this problem. But we'll leave it um, for a moment because right now we need to talk about hey, we know the limiting factors, but how do we measure the rate of photosynthesis? Now, in the previous uh, video, we talked about the Hill reaction, which is one of um, the ways that you can measure the rate of photosynthesis. But what the Hill reaction is measuring is really how, what is the rate of the light-dependent reaction, not really the light-independent reaction. So this one here is in general, and also this one uh, measures the plant. That one is more of isolated chloroplast uh, out of the entire plant. So this is actually the whole plant, and in this case, we'll be using an aquatic plant such as Elodea and Cambomba. Why do we use, use aquatic plants instead of land plants? Well, the reason is being it's easier to measure the product, which is oxygen. Anyways. Aquatic plants such as Elodea and Camomba is used in this experiment, and this setup here, both this setup, um, could be called many names. You can use a gas syringe that looks like this. You can call it a microburette or, or even a photosynthometer. Now this here is a very simplified version of this experiment, which is less accurate but works, which is to calculate, um, which is to use an inverted test tube of some sort. But this is a problem because it doesn't have graduated, it's not graduated, so you don't know if it has a degree or not. Just kidding. You don't know um, what the exact volume of oxygen is. Anyways, I'll stop being a stand-up comedian and move on. Now, this is a paper 5 question, so pay attention. Um, these are the steps to investigate the rate of photosynthesis. Number one, we are using aquatic plants, so we need to cut a shoot of aquatic plants must be cleanly, must be underwater, and probably slanting. This is to avoid the formation of air bubbles in the xylem, which may affect the rate of photosynthesis as well as you know transpiration. So cut the slam cleanly underwater. Make sure the plant must be well illuminated before use, so that it is not limited by um, it might it won't die lah, Okay, it just won't die keep it alive. Anyways, after that, you're going to place the shoot in a tube of hydrogen carbonate solution. So this uh, water here is not just water, it is 
water with hydrogen carbonate solution to provide the CO2 needed in order to carry out photosynthesis. And of course, this water bath that is around it would also act as a way to maintain temperature and keep it constant throughout the experiment. Now, there is a side note here in order to make sure this experiment is properly done. Before you actually do this, you need to make sure that the water you use must be aerated beforehand to prevent other gases from dissolving in it. So it's saturated with dissolved gases already. Okay, anyways, what is the third step? The third step here is to place it in different conditions to investigate its effect on the rate of photosynthesis. Now, we always uh, investigate the paper 5 always asks you questions on how to investigate the effect of a certain limiting factor on the rate of photosynthesis. So these are some examples. They may ask you how do you determine the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis. So th this is how. You place a light source, minimum 5 different distances, little typo that, minimum 5 different distances from plant you can use minimum five different color filters if you are testing um, the effect of the wavelength of light. If you're investigating the effect of concentration of carbon dioxide, you can replace the hydrogen carbonate uh, solution with five different concentrations of it. Use different concentrations and then measure the rate of photosynthesis. Or you can use, we can even investigate the effect of temperature using water bath of minimum 5 different temperatures as well. Now you realize here that I keep saying minimum 5 and that's because that's the goal intended. Sometimes, actually all the time, in paper 5 is probably to list an example of the 5 different temperatures or list an example of the 5 different concentrations used in order to get the mark point. Okay, anyways, we're not done yet. We have cut the shoot. We have placed it in hydrogen carbonate solution. We are going to place it in different conditions, whatever that may be, depending on the question. Um, we have to describe the way we place them in different conditions and measure the depend independent variable. So now we have to measure our dependent variable. How do we do this? Well, first we allow it to acclimatize, obviously, but we measure our in uh, dependent variable. So the responding variable, dependent variable, by counting number of bubbles of oxygen gas produced per unit time, or collect the oxygen gas and measure the volume produced per unit time. This could be anywhere um, if you're using a graduated pipette or a upside down measuring cylinder that is graduated. Again, you can find the volume produced or you can calculate it by seeing how uh, the length of the air bubble, the distance the air has moved in this little tube, and then times it by the area of the tube. Like in the question, I gave you a few quizzes ago. Anyways, yes, you describe to them how you measure dependent variable in any way you want, as long as legit and then at the end of the paper 5 you uh, question you should always talk about how you are going to repeat it at least three times and obtain a mean because that makes an experiment more reliable so that's how you measure the rate of photosynthesis using aquatic plant so we have learned that there are a few limiting factors again, right? There is temperature, there is carbon dioxide concentration, and that's also light intensity, not necessarily in that order. 